Where's the beginning of understanding neurolinguistic programming? It really is an understanding the assumptions that NLP practitioners make in order to utilize NLP in effective ways. It really doesn't matter the context that NLP is being provided. This could be in communications between individuals. It could be in therapeutic environments. It could be in business and leadership development. It could be in working with the community. These assumptions are the assumptions that most NLP patterns, techniques, and ideas are really rested on. Now, this is something important to know about NLP. NLP is sometimes questioned by those in the academic community. What well, can we prove that these techniques actually work? Well, problem number one with that sort of an approach is there are a multiplicity of techniques and a multiplicity of, of, of different arenas or worlds. And the result is it's actually impossible to put everything in NLP to the test. There would have to be hundreds, if not thousands of tests. But NLP is not theoretical. A theoretical approach looks to prove a hypothesis. Rather, neurolinguistic begins with certain assumptions. It's believed that most people who practice NLP would share the validity of these assumptions. But these assumptions are neither trying to be proven by NLP, they are simply accepted as guiding principles to help us do the work of NLP. It's this kind of flexibility that allows NLP to be so adaptable into so many different situations. Let's begin with NLP presupposition number one, and that is the map is not the territory. What I mean by that is that we have an assumption about the world and the experiences that are in front of us. This is our mental map. But the reality is when we find ourselves engaged with individuals or situations or in the world around us, we discover that the territory sometimes is different than the map. I don't know if you've ever taken out your phone GPS and you put in a location and you start to head there and you notice that the map or the, the, the GPS is deviating you from a way that your intuition tells you you should go. Well, this is because Waze or Google knows that maybe there's an accident up ahead or a road is closed ahead. And so the reality is the territory is different than the map. In NLP, this is a very important assumption because NLP has the ability to be flexibly applied in a number of different situations. And if we find that one approach doesn't work, unlike the theoretical model, the presumption model allows us to simply flow with a different set of resources and skills to adapt to the situation that's in front of us in the real world. This is why neurolinguistic programming practiced by practitioners in therapeutic environments, hypnotherapy, life coaching, find it such a valuable tool because we can equip our clients to function within the territory, not just with the projections based on what the map looked like to them. Presupposition number two, it is better to have choices than it is to not have choices. What this means is that everything we're doing in a coaching model, everything we're doing using NLP should be designed to give us, as leaders, flexibility and choices. The way we work with somebody can actually change in the middle of a session. But what this means for our clients is that we can help them open doors so that the only choice they thought they had in front of them becomes one of many choices that they can access because of the techniques or the patterns or the ideas of neurolinguistic programming. This is one of my favorite things about NLP is it helps a person who often realizes that they're stuck between a rock and a hard place to realize that there are many opportunities for them and that the place isn't so hard and that rocks can actually be moved. Without a doubt, having many choices is always better than having no choices. And in NLP, this is a presupposition that we work from so that we can help people to brainstorm, use their creative capacity, the resources that they didn't know existed within them to help them access new choices in just about any situation, whether that's personal, whether that's business, whether that's therapeutic within their community, their family, or even in self-reflection as they look at the choices they have within their own life. Presupposition number three is that when people have choices, they will choose the choice that is best for them. Now, this is really important because we not, might not perceive the choice 
they have made as being the best for other people, but people will choose the choice that's actually best for them. Sometimes we see somebody make a choice and that choice doesn't seem to even be good for them. But it's important to realize what this pre-preposition pre, pre, uh, pre is telling us is that with the tools they have, in the moment they make that choice, they're choosing ultimately the option that they believe is actually best for them. Perhaps it's the easiest to make or the most accessible to make. And what it does is it gives us understanding and empathy and compassion. Those are the tools for actually helping people make change. The good news is that in life coaching and NLP, when people try and they make a choice that might not be the best choice for them in the future, we come up with tools and patterns and ideas and tools to help them make different choices. Each moment is independent from each moment. This gives us the ability to, 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 to really operate under the pre, pre preposition that, uh, that people make the best choice they can in the moment that they make that choice. This is related to presupposition number four, and that is that people work perfectly. One of the viewpoints that really comes from the work of Milton Erickson was that people are not broken. People work perfectly. It's amazing to see people in our world who've had extremely difficult circumstances and scenarios and yet be able to rise from these experiences and these occasions. People are not broken. People work perfectly. And this is a presupposition that is really important because what it means is that we can approach life coaching not from a psychological or a psychiatric perspective where we're trying to fix broken people and help them to become well after being unwell. But in the NLP modeling, what we do is we see people as working perfectly, making the best choices they can in the scenarios that they can, and that we have a role in helping them to work perfectly and work efficiently and work in a way that can help them rise to their highest level of potential. This is one of the things that really separates life coaching from psychotherapy. Psychotherapists are taking people with a diagnosis who aren't functioning adequately and trying to get them to function at an adequate level. But in life coaching, we're taking people who work perfectly, people who are functioning at an adequate level, and we're helping them rise to their highest level of peak performance. Number five, all actions have purpose. Or as the psychiatrist R.D. Lang said, all madness has meaning. What this means is that in the life, even the things that don't appear to be beneficial to a person are beneficial to them if they've taken an action on that. Let's take an obvious example here, cigarette smoking. Why the side of the pack of cigarettes tells you it's not healthy. It says this product is uh, causes cancer, lung disease, emphysema, may complicate pregnancy. This is not a good thing and you shouldn't do it. But if you ask any smoker who's got that message in their pocket on their pack of cigarettes, why do they smoke? What they'll tell you is they need to relax or they'll tell you they need a break or it helps them to control stress. Uh, the reality is, all behavior, even behavior which is unhealthy behavior, meets a legitimate need. In our coaching, this can really inform us because when we see somebody who's doing something that we perceive as being unhealthy to them, we can discover the legitimate need and then ask the question, is there another way to help this person meet this legitimate need? No matter how maladaptive the behavior is, or how mad the behavior is in the language of psychiatrist R.D. Lang, the reality is that madness has meaning. And that meaning should be honored, and that meaning should be embraced, so that we can help the clients who we work with find the ways of meeting their deepest needs through healthy behaviors and choices that help them to live their best life. Number six, one of the more controversial presuppositions is that all behavior has positive intention. You see, one of the things we're going to look at as we look at NLP is short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. We're going to look at uh, towards motivation and away from motivation. But the presupposition here is that when our clients are engaging in a behavior, the goal of that behavior is a positive intention, not a malevolent intention. This is an important presupposition that can help us to really understand the best ways to work with the clients who come to see us for life coaching, NLP, and therapy. 
Presupposition number seven. The meaning of communication is not just the message sent, but the response that we get from that communication. I think a lot of people take this course because they want to become a more effective communicator, a more effective communicator in business, a more effective communicator in the community, the family, in therapy. A lot of people look at NLP as a tool for enhanced communication. It's important to recognize that communication is not simply the words that are said, but the way the receiver experienced the communication that was given. This is a good tool to help me in self-reflection understand how my communication with the world around me can be more effective. I can study formula sentences like assertive communication, I feel, want, or need blank, but the reality is the receiver's response to my communication tells me what the content of that communication was. Presupposition number eight comes directly from Milton Erickson, and that is that we have the resources within us, or we have the ability to create the resources within us that can serve us in any situation at any time. Part of this course is going to be helping you to develop internal resources, resource states, strategies that to this point you haven't activated yet in your life, and then to be able to passionately share those with other clients. It's really important to realize that when Milton Erickson was doing his work in medical hypnotherapy, psychiatry, he wasn't trying to bring something from the outside to people to help them function at their best, but rather was trying to draw out that which was in them into their world so that they could live their very best. Number nine, mind, body, conscious, unconscious. These are divisions that we use to help us understand different ways of how we experience the world around us. The reality is mind and body and conscious and unconscious are inseparable. Mind-body connection is a unified whole. This is an important presupposition because in learning we like to say, well, this is the subconscious mind, this is the unconscious mind, this is the conscious mind, but the reality is mind is mind. I've always said that if I were to ask a room full of people, draw a picture of the mind, most people would draw a picture of the brain. But the reality is mind is in every cell of the body and mind and body are inseparable from one another. This is the idea of the Tao. This is not a new idea. This is a 5,000 year old idea. And if you watch the webcast that preceded the beginning of this course on the scrolls of the Guiguza from ancient China, this concept or this idea should already be familiar to you. Number 10 is my favorite presupposition, and that is that we experience the world around us through our senses. Now, we're going to talk often about auditory, visual, and kinesthetic, sight, sound, and touch. These are the primary representational systems or the primary sensorial systems in which we engage in the world around us. But we also have many other senses. We have, of course, the five senses we learned in second grade. Uh, we have our, 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 our touch, our sight, and our sound. We have our taste and our smell, but we also have additional senses. There aren't just five senses. Seventh grade science was wrong. We have proprioception. We have many other senses that we can tap into as ways of understanding the world around us. In neurolinguistic programming, a large emphasis has been placed on the auditory visual and kinesthetic model. And we're going to spend a lot of time in this course focusing on that and teaching that. But we're also going to recognize that there are many other ways to understand the world around us. But all understandings that we have come ultimately from a sensorial experiences, whether it's the AVK, whether it's the five basic senses, or the many other senses that we have. Number 11, modeling success leads to excellence. If I want to know how to do something excellent, I should model and do the same things that people who are successful are doing. This is a presupposition of NLP. So that when a client wants to do something better, all we have to ask is who are the exemplars? Who are the models for success in this endeavor? And then we can tap into the methods, the approaches, the techniques, the experiences, the ideas of those who are successful and we can then create excellence in our own life and with the clients who we work with. Again, my favorite presupposition of all is that we can replicate those who are successful and create excellence in our own life. We don't have to reinvent the wheel 
People have gone before us in these tasks and created high levels of success. Number 12. The way to understand is to take action. It's not enough to simply think in our own mind, but rather to have true understanding, to have depth in our lives. We need to take actions because actions create repetition. The repetition leads to learnings, and these learnings lead to an understanding that can truly help us to create success. You've probably heard it said that mastery of any task, playing the violin, the piano, or something else, takes 10,000 hours of practice, and that's because this presupposition that to understand requires action is a presupposition that not only NLP practitioners use, but teachers from around the world have focused on. The 13th NLP presupposition is, of course, that we can't not communicate. This is really important. We are always communicating. We're always communicating with those who are present with us, and sometimes we're communicating with those who are not present with us. Think of a family that has become estranged, and one person says, I will never talk to you again. And five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years goes by. 30 years of silence, yet something is still being communicated. So the reality is we cannot not communicate. We can be silent, we can close our mouth, we cannot speak, but we still communicate. 93% of our communication is in fact not the contents of the words that we use. Neurolinguistic programming recognizes this. And one of the things I'm looking forward to in this class is sharing some ideas from Chase Hughes on body language. If we're lucky, we'll actually get Chase Hughes to participate in some of our forums. He's right now the world leading expert in really understanding behavioral analysis and body language. And I've learned so much from him over the years that I've been a friend and a colleague of his that these ideas, I think, should always be shared in an NLP training program. Presupposition number 14, the person in any system, whether it's at work, whether it's in a family, uh, whether it's in a community, the person who has the greatest flexibility is the person who actually holds the power in any given situation or encounter or experience. In life coaching, part of what we're going to be focusing on is helping people to develop psychological flexibility. The last presupposition, my absolute favorite, there is no such thing as failure. There is only feedback. We learn from our mistakes. I had dinner with my cousin last night. He's 55, I'm 55. We're three months apart in age. I didn't have a brother. He didn't have a brother. So we were cousin brothers. And we spent time talking about being kids together and adolescence and uh, young adulthood and both of us in business as adults. And, and, and without a doubt, both of us are extremely grateful for where we are today. Neither one of us would change the past even when it's been difficult because it wouldn't have brought us to the same point where we are today. The reality is there is no such thing as failure. There is only feedback and lessons that can be learned. I hear many people talk about their previous failed marriages. I was once on a date with somebody who said to me, how many failed marriages have you had? The question caught me aback because I never thought of any previous marriage as a failure, only as experiences that brought me to where I am today. This is really important because a lot of people are hard on themselves because they view their, 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 their uh, mistakes as, as failures and their decisions as failures and their life as a failure. There is no such thing as failure. There is only feedback. And in life coaching and business coaching and in our families, uh, we can help people to realize that no matter how far down the scale we have gone, we can see how our experiences can benefit others. Now these presuppositions are all very helpful but these presuppositions also have a very practical element to them. So I suppose I could share with you two exercises that you could do to kind of prepare for this class. The first exercise is to really brainstorm what your options are. Think about a situation that you're facing right now, a choice that you need to make. Maybe it's one where you feel a little bit between a rock or a hard place and can only come up with one or two choices and neither of them appear to be great for you. Or perhaps you recognize that there are a couple choices you can make, three or four or five, but the reality is endless choices actually abound in our world. It might feel like we only have one or two choices and that no option is a good option or that we're limited to a couple of choices of which some of them might have some upside. 
one of my favorite things to do with a client when they're faced with a choice is to give them a blank piece of paper and a pen and to say, I'd like you to write down 30 things. And I know it sounds like a lot, but 30 things you could do in this situation. By the way, they're not necessarily things you're committing to. They're not even necessarily things that you want to do or that you think are good. But I want you to write down 30 things that you could do in this situation. And I'll have my client write those 30 things down and I'll give them time to do it. It might take five or 10 or 15 minutes. Some of them might be absurd. Well, I could start the couch on fire or, you know, or, or, or I, I could, uh, I, I could never go back to that scenario or situation or, you know, I could do this. Uh, I, I could uh, release my anger. I could meditate. I could communicate with assertive communication. I mean, the possibilities here are endless. But really, most of us haven't stretched our brain when faced with choice and considered the many choices that abound beyond those that are obvious. And when I write down 30 things that I could do other than in any situation, it always creates the resource state of creativity. Now I can look at those 30 things. Are there anything on that list I'd be unwilling to do or that would be unsafe or illegal or dangerous to do? Cross those out right? Now maybe I have 12 things left on the list, 15 things left on the list. Of those things, is there anything on that list that I could do if I wanted to? Hmm. Considering the 12 things that are left on this list, there are a couple of things that I could do if I wanted to. I'll circle the five of those things and I'll cross off the rest. Now I'm down to five options. Of those five options, is there anything here that I would be willing to try? Is there anything in this list that I'd be willing to lead with that could be my first attempt? Well, it's this one. This is a simple brainstorming exercise in creating options. And it comes from the NLP presupposition, of course, that having options is better than not having options. And so these presuppositions actually give us useful tools and exercises that we can engage in. I've given you a PDF. That PDF has uh, some methods for psychological flexibility. Again, remember the presuppositions, the person who has the greatest level of flexibility has the power of any situation. And so there are five things we can do to increase our psychological flexibility. First of all, we can engage our mind in new things, new learnings, and new opportunities. So often, flexibility comes from expanding our horizons and making our world bigger. The second principle for developing psychological is to do something we've been doing, but do it differently. It could be as simple as the way you dress. It could be as simple as a habit of putting your watch on the right arm instead of on the left arm. It really doesn't matter. The idea here is to do something differently. And then the third component of developing psychological flexibility is to do different things. Maybe try not wearing a watch. Maybe try using a pocket watch, right? So really what we're looking for is we're looking for the way to do things differently. And then the fourth principle is to do something different somewhere else, expanding our world, making the repertoire of possibilities much larger. And then to develop psychological flexibility, we can put this into practice by doing something different in different places with different people which gives us an opportunity to use a popular NLP pattern, TOTE, test, operate, test, evaluate. So psychological flexibility and the techniques of psychological flexibility can be, can be harnessed and accessed by really understanding these NLP presuppositions.